Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I saw a funny saying the other day, and the way it starts out is probably something most of us have heard before. You know, you're, it, it starts out with, when I was a young child, my mother told me I can be anyone I want to be. Did you hear that before when you were growing up? I heard it. Well, here's how the saying goes. As a young child, my mother told me I can be anyone I want to be. Turns out that's called identity theft. Of course, identity theft is, it's really a serious thing. It's not really a laughing matter. You know, I got a bunch of statistics. I looked them up. Uh, 2010, what was it? 7% of U U.S. households experienced some form of identity theft. 2012, another set of statistics. 16.6 uh, .6 million U.S. Reg residents aged 16 and over experienced an incident or multiple incidences of identity theft in that year alone. And that doesn't even count the NSA knowing everything about us. You can see this just by the impact. You can see the impact just if you watch TV. Look at the commercials. What do you see? Credit protection services, credit notification services, credit repair services, identity protection subscriptions, and on and on and on. And half of the problem is that we make it so darn easy. 2012, do you know what the number one most popular password was? Anybody want to take a guess? That's number two. Password. <laughs> it's the perennial favorite every year. That's on top of the list. Password. And the second one, which Diana guessed, is one, two, three, four, five, six. QWERTY is another one that's always in the top ten. You just go across the top of your keyboard. I love you is always up there. <laughs> It doesn't take a criminal mastermind to figure this stuff out when we make it that easy. So I'm going to give you, this, the sermon's really not about this, but I want to give you a tip before you leave today. Maybe it'll help one person today. If you have a Facebook page, and on your Facebook page it gives your whole date of birth, including the year, take the year off. Because if somebody accesses your Facebook page, they've got, already got your date of birth, they can look at your list of who you list as family members, and they can take a pretty good guess what your mother's maiden name is. Then all they got to do is Google your address, and they're off to the races. Hello, come steal my credit. <laughs> so if you don't do anything else, take the year of your birth off. And then also people won't know how old you are, which can be a big plus. <laughs> Given all that, it's going to sound a little odd what I'm going to say to you now. Jesus takes your identity. Jesus takes your identity. I'm not accusing Jesus of a felony, by the way, so <laughs> hear me out on this, but, but think about it. What happened when Jesus came to the Jordan River to be baptized by Paul? You can see it in John's reaction, John the Baptist's reaction. He's been baptizing everybody and anybody. They're, they're all coming to him, thieves and adulterers, liars and gossips, collaborators and prostitutes. Every single one of them who comes receives that baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Everybody is welcome. No one is barred until Jesus comes. And you catch what John says to Jesus in our translation. It says he tried to get him to change his mind. In another Bible translation, it says that John would have prevented him from being baptized. I can just picture, no, no, Jesus, no. Stay away from this water. This water is not for you. Stay away. It may seem a bit difficult for us to understand why John wanted to prevent Jesus from being baptized. Well, let me give you a little story to give you, maybe give you some insight on why that is. Anybody here ever heard of the name Sam Houston? History? No? The, the guy, the city of Houston, Texas is named after. A little bit of trivia. He's the only person in U.S. history who served as governor of two different states. He started out as governor of Tennessee, left Tennessee, Went to Texas when Texas was still a part of Mexico. Got involved in the Texas Revolution, was one of the military leaders. 
uh, was elected as the first president of the Republic of Texas, took a term off, and then was elected as the third president of the Republic of Texas. And when Texas became a state, he was elected as governor of the state of Texas. So he's quite a guy, quite a reputation as a leader. He also acquired another reputation along the way because he was known for a pretty wild, no-holds-barred lifestyle, the kind of stuff the Bible calls debauchery and licentious, licentiousness. In fact, one of his Indian names was Big Drunk. <laughs> Sam Houston was already 61 years old when he decided it was time to put all that part of his life behind him. And he consented to be baptized in the little rocky creek. The preacher took him down to the waters of little rocky creek and reminded him before he stepped into the water, he said, Sam, your sins are going to be washed away in this water, every single one of them. And when you come up out of this stream, you're going to be standing clean before God. Well, Sam Houston looked at the water and said to the preacher, I sure do feel sorry for those folks living downstream that have to drink that water. <laughs> now picture the Jordan River. And it's carrying away the sins of hundreds, maybe thousands of people. They all left their sins in that water, and they're all emerging from it, standing clean before God. And John says, Jesus, you don't belong in that water. Out of all the people in the world, you're the one who doesn't belong there. And Jesus says in one Bible translation, he says, let it be so for now, for it's proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. And with that, John consents and baptizes Jesus in that Jordan River to be one of us and one with us. In that water, Jesus takes on our sin-saturated identity. In that water, he stands with about two billion people who are alive today who have also been washed in baptismal water, and in a few minutes we're going to make it two, thousand, two billion and one. He's stand, standing with all those throughout history who have been baptized in the baptismal water, notorious sinners like Sam Houston, garden variety sinners like most of the rest of us, but all of us struggling with that inherited propensity towards sin. And in that water, Jesus takes our identity. He becomes one with us and one of us. But the reverse also happens. We take his identity. I don't know if you remember this. It's going back a few years, not really long, but it's been a few years. Uh, LifeLock, the identity protection subscription company, they used to, their CEO, Todd Davis, used to advertise and put on billboards his social security number. He said, go ahead, try to take my identity. It was on billboards, it was in magazines, TV commercials. Todd Davis, this is my social security number. Go ahead, try to take it. Turns out, several people did. <laughs> they took him up on it. Thirteen people stole Todd Davis's identity in the years 2007, 2008, when that advertising campaign ran. Probably one of the reasons they don't run that particular campaign anymore. But isn't that what Jesus is doing in that water? He's saying, take my identity. When he steps into those waters, he's not only taking our identity, he's saying to us, come take mine and take it all. Martin Luther had a term for this. He called it the joyous exchange. So Jesus takes our sin, we take his righteousness. Jesus takes our death, we take his eternal life. What a deal. You, all of you, possess or can possess the identity of Jesus. But if you have it, don't be selfish. You don't need to hoard it. You can give that identity to others. Let me conclude with a little story told by Tony Campolo. Uh, Tony is a famous preacher, author, and professor, and he's got a lot, 
It's got lots and lots of stories. I really like this one. The story is about a skid row bum named Joe. Joe, like Sam Houston, had seen it all. He'd done most of it. But one day, his life changed. Jesus came into his life. And he was washed in the waters of baptism. He was claimed as a child of God. The Spirit rested on him like it does on all those who receive baptism. But in Joe's case, the Spirit didn't let him rest. Joe's life had changed, and he made it his mission to help Jesus change other lives. So he devoted himself to working in the Skid Row mission where he had found Jesus. Joe cleaned the toilets, he swept the floors, he mopped up the vomit, he served food, he guided those who were struggling to their cots, and then he went out and searched the streets for those who were cold and hungry. And he did it all with a contagious joy of one who knows that he's called. One evening in that mission, the pastor was giving his nightly message to the gathered unfortunates, and one man was moved, and he ran forward, and he knelt down before the altar. And he said, make me like Joe, God. God, make me like Joe. And the pastor came over, put an arm around him, and said, son, it'd be a better prayer if you said, make me like Jesus, make me like Jesus. The man looked at him and said, why, is he like Joe? Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.